hi again. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I think in a way this topic connects connects a bit of what are we what we have been talking about yesterday and today, this division or this di different ideas of the musical work or like the musical art or the idea of how the composer develop its musical work. So hopefully <coughs> we can connect this, our different opinions and topics and discuss a bit later. Um, <coughs> this is also a part of my PhD research, but it's about uh, musicians' working lives and especially musicians' organizations. And I pick, uh, I select a specific part of it. Uh, it's <coughs> during the transition of one kind of organization to another. And it's also framed uh, during the early 20th century. So it will also connect with what we've talking, we have been talking about of of the musical institution, the institutionalism of music in Chile. So, <coughs> and also it's a perspective, not from Santiago, but from the provinces, specifically from Valparaíso. So, hopefully this offers a new, a different perspective of our very centralized country. So, of musicians from not from Santiago. So. <coughs> Um, yeah, just it's okay. Yeah, uh, Tilian music have, has been written either centered in key musicians or focused in musical genres. Or we have read about the history of music in Chile, uh, about particular individuals who had done a great contribution towards music, being composers, performers, teachers, conductors arrangers, researchers, producers, etc. We also learn about the history of certain orchestras, ensembles, music genres, styles, or music, musical trends. However, what we can find about musicians' organizations is very little, especially those that gather musicians looking to improve their working and life conditions. In this paper, I argue that musicians' organizations had played a pivotal but largely unexplored role in Chilean music history to better their life and the working condition of its members, to create certain music institutions such as orchestras or academies, to spread a particular music gender across the country, and also to outline a definition of a music profession. In this presentation, I will reflect on why musicians have got congregated in different kinds of organizations, the aims that they have followed, and the musician status associated to one or to another organization. To do this is key to include the theoretical approach of treating musicians as workers. This is not an original approach, such as different scholars, such as uh, Atali, Becker, Elrich, Kraft, Loft, Stahl, Williamson and Clunan have all placed emphasis on musicians as people undertaking work. However, what is interesting, what it is interesting here is to address the differences and eventual conflicts between different sorts of musicians in terms of the work that they undertake in the division of labor in the artistic production. These differences are expressed in the status that it is assigned to them and in the aims that the organizations have followed. The role that of that the musicians' organizations has not been taken into account by music scholars in Chile, with a focus in the first musicians' union created in Chile, specifically in Valparaíso in 1931, and its president, the Musicians' Mutual Aid Society of Valparaíso, I will deliver this paper reflecting on the characteristics of the musicians that gathered in this organization, on the connections and exchanges that it established with other contemporary organizations, and especially on the controversies on the musical work. To start with this analysis, I would like to outline a definition of what I mean 
when I refer to a working musician or a musician as a worker. A simple definition would be that a working musician is anyone who earns a living from music, even if it's full-time or partial-time, or if it's combined with other non-musical jobs, immersed in a broader context, including the complex matrix of industries clustered in and around music. This is why this paper invites to think on how musicians had defined themselves and how they had outlined it a music profession, on the role that the musicians' organizations had accomplished towards this. This is not an easy task, especially because the perspective of the musical work has been barely invisible in Chilean music historiography. It is very unlikely to find previous research directly concerning a musical work in Chile, it is also hard to find research about the sort of activities that musicians have undertook regarding working life, working and life conditions and social organization. This takes me This takes me to the main argument that I want to discuss in this paper, understanding musicians as workers. What would happen if we think of musicians as workers? What are the consequences of treating musicians as a particular sort of workers seeking remuneration within the complex context of the music industries? And on the other hand, how musicians have thought of themselves as craftsmen, as professionals, as artists? Are musicians workers? To address this reflection, I've chosen the methodology of case study in order to provide insights into musicians' working lives and to provide further understanding of the musicians' organizations. One key musician that embodied all the questions that I want to address in this paper is Pablo Garrido. Probably some of you have heard something about Pablo Garrido, either as the main promoter of jazz in Chile or the conductor of several orchestras, as a composer of futuristic music, or a folklore researcher, or the conductor of several orchestras, sorry, <laughs> or a folklore research. But how many of you have thought of Garrido as a worker? Obviously, a worker in the music trade, but a worker anyway. The documents held by the Musicians' Union of Valparaíso and also his published writings show that Garrido was one of the few musicians of the time that addressed the working conditions of Chilean musicians. He did so considering a broad variety of sorts of musicians, composers, conductors or performers, professionals or amateurs, with formal music training or self-trained musicians from Santiago or from the provinces, during classical, avant-garde, or popular music. He defined himself as a worker in the musical trade, and also he promoted the improvement of the working condition of Chilean musicians, pursing both to call the attention of the Chilean society regarding the status of the music profession, and also to make a call for unity among musicians, in order to claim united, to the state to take actions to protect Chilean music and musicians. He accomplished relevant roles following both aims. On the one hand, he wrote periodically in newspapers about the problems that musicians were facing, and on the other, he joined and led several artistic organizations. In this matter, he was a promoter of musicians' working rights, claiming for new regulations on copyright, on radio broadcasting, on promotion of national music, on music education, and on labor, lo for laws, on labor laws for musicians. As he worked in various music scenes, he established connections between classical and popular musicians, between composers and performers, between academic and amateur or self-trained musicians, and also between well-known and also between the backup musicians that are basically barely hidden or invisible in music history. Here we can see Garrido in his one of some of his different uh, works, like a conductor of jazz music uh, in his string quartet, 
and as a conductor, but also uh, in this uh, gi giving autographs like an artist <laughs> and with some posters behind him of some theatrical or orchestras. <coughs> In 1924, Garrido joined the Musicians Mutual Aid Society of Valparaiso, the same year when the Sociedad Baj was founded in Santiago by Domingo Santa Cruz, and the social laws were promulgated in Chile, affecting dramatically the labor movement and especially the mutual aid societies. Very much it can be said about this. First of all, what was the Musicians Mutual Aid Society of Valparaiso? It was an organization formed by and for musicians based in the province of Valparaiso, which aim was to better the life condition of its members. It was founded in the midst of an oligarchic political system and the rise of the labor movement in 1893. Among its founder was the Italian maestro Pedro Cesare. He arrived in Valparaiso in 1884, and he formed and conducted the Orfeón Municipal, the marching band of the municipality. He was also in charge to solve the problem of the turning fork of military bands. He taught bel canto to upper-class young ladies, composed military music, patriotic anthems, and several pieces for piano and vocals, and this was especially renewed as a composer, music instructor, and orchestral conductor. However, he's not, he has not been addressed as a mutualist, as this research shows. This society gathered musicians on the, of the province of Valparaiso and offered them medical, pharmacy, and funerary services to support the well-being of its members. It was open to, I quote, any musician, amateur, and artist in the art of music. In other words, to anybody who made a living, even if partially, in music, with no matter what music they perform, compose, or conduct. Like in other countries, in Chile, mutual aid societies emerge closely related to the processes of urbanization and industrialization that took place from the mid-19th century, framed under the social question background, which affected especially to the working class. With the foundation of the Musicians Mutual Aid Society of Valparaiso, musicians followed the, mo the model of other late 19th century mutual aid societies that gathered skilled workers from different industries like typesetters, plumbers, cigar makers, hairdressers, etc. With the passing of time, this mutual aid society of musicians changed in several ways, but its primary aim to better the life condition of its members remained. They sought to accomplish this objective through different activities, such as the creation of a music academy, the annual celebration of the St. Cecilia Music Day, and the creation of social security funds. They also established connections and exchanges with fellow organizations, such as mutual aid societies of Valparaiso, musical clubs of the city, and other musicians' organizations. In 1924, Pablo Garrido served as the secretary of this Musicians Mutual Aid Society of Valparaiso when he was only 19 years old. This was the same year when he presented his royal orchestra, a jazz orchestra in the main music halls of Valparaiso. As said above, this was also the year when the Sociedad Baj was founded in Santiago, an association of academic musicians who sought to spread and promote classical music throughout the country, but had nothing to do with musicians' working, life, working or life conditions. They were more concerned about promoting certain music throughout the country through concerts and music education rather than on the life condition of its members. But it does not mean that they were not concerned about their own working lives. To understand the coexistence of these two kinds of organizations, I want to briefly recap a bit of context. By the end of the 1920s and the beginning of the 1930s, 
uh, it was an, an easy era. Social and political context changed dramatically in the country. The middle class was coalescing, the labor movement was strong, and the government unstable. In 1924, the social laws were promulgated, which were the direct response of what the mutual aid movement was demanding. But at the same time, this meant that the serious decline of mutualism and the rise of unionism, which was enhanced by the new constitution of 1925 and the law of unionization of 1928. But what does this have, what, sorry, what does this all have to do with musicians? From the mid-1920s, the Musicians' Mutual Aid Society began to decline. In 1928, the orchestral section was created, that was created under the umbrella of the Musicians' Mutual Aid Society was declared dissolved, putting an end to the provision of music training by the mutualized musicians in Valparaiso. This was also the year when the National Conservatoire, located in Santiago, was reformed under the leadership of Domingo Santa Cruz, making it more elitist, providing music education to young musicians from wealthy families, and incorporating it to the Faculty of Arts of the Universidad de Chile, transforming the music training into an academic study. During these years, radical changes in the music industries took place as well such as the arrival of the sound cinema technologies that seriously harmed musicians' working lives, the proliferation of radio broadcasting, and the creation of new venues and orchestras that would provide alternative workplaces for musicians. These changes were immersed in the general economic crisis that the country was facing after the global downturn of 1929 that had a negative impact not only in musicians' working lives but in the whole society. The laws on copyright that were promulgated in 1925 began to show the conflicts among musicians from the last years of the decade. This law on intellectual property and copyrights concerned all intellectual creations, such as lectures, architectural works, theater, cinema, music compositions. However, certain musicians were unsatisfied regarding the protection of authorship for musicians whose intellectual copyrights seem to be less protected than those of other performing arts like the theatrical art actors. One of these musicians was Pablo Garrido, who wrote a piece about this issue in one of the most relevant newspapers of Valparaiso of the time. In, yeah, in June, 19, June 1928, calling for the attention towards the rights of the musical authors, especially for those creating popular music. Um, there are the quotes in Spanish, but I'm going to read it in English. Now that there is a strong interest in Chilean music works, in the popular journey, something has to be done towards the rights of the musical authors. This is necessary because the music author always has been neglected regarding its legitimate rights. He cited the example of the theatrical, theatrical art authors who collected their copyrights through the Society of Authors, Sociedad de Autores. He also exemplified with the case of more developed countries, such as Argentina at the time, where the protection on performance and reproduction right already existed he called the local composers, I quote, to come to an agreement and ask to whom main concern the promulgation of laws to protect their creations. And he continued arguing that, I quote again, the creative, the creative musicians has no guarantee because if he or she achieves that any publisher buy its work, it will pay scandalously, scandalously cheap prices and beyond that, the composer cannot expect anything else. He explained the situation using an hypothetical example when an author sold its musical work in a ridiculous price and it results in a success and argues that, I quote, who made, who made the business here if who did nothing at all? Referring to who, brought, who bought the musical work or who published it in a record, but not who created it. In this respect, Garrido assigned a higher value to authorship, the composition, and the creative work, rather than to the work of a producer, a manager, or any non-creative work in the music industries. 
who distribute the musical work, but did not create it. Following this argument, Garrido explained that, on the contrary, here, on the contrary, if the musical work results in a total failure, the publisher will always sell it at the same price. In other words, he or she will sell the first edition, spreading it in the, na in the same way that in the previous case to all his or her customers in neighboring provinces and countries. He claimed that this situation would only be acceptable in the case that the regulatory framework includes the performance and reproduction rights, after which any orchestra that plays any piece should pay a certain small amount each time that the piece is printed in programs. Besides the inclusion of performance and reproduction rights, Garrido stated that some official entity should control this situation by, for example, a weekly revision of musical programs and the subsequent distribution uh, and collection of copyrights. He concluded saying that, quote, the only advantage that a composer has nowadays is to record his or her work in a gramophone album. But to guarantee some payment in exchange of it, this recording, it is necessary that the composition rely on high quality in order to get the interest of the general public who pays the financial support of the recording industry. He also claimed on the need to control the international intellectual property, because nowadays the misappropriation of musical work is outrageous. He ended this piece asking, why the society of composers that exists in the capital city has not undertaken this initiative, which only corresponds to it to take? The society of composers that Garrido addressed it was the Sociedad de Compositores Chilenos, founded in Santiago in 1920. The relevance of this lays in the notion that this society only worked towards classical musicians, or those professional composers linked to the National Conservator. This is clear in a later article published in 1939, where Garrido criticized this society for not including popular music composers and called for the creation of one under the Professional Union or Professional Orchestral Union or Sindicato Profesional Orquestal, founded in Santiago in 1932, where he served as president from 1939 to 1940. I think that this shows some of the frictions between popular and classical musicians between those working as session or backup musicians and those in the National Conservatoire, as Elri in Elric's words, between players and gentlemen. As Pablo Garrido enjoyed a privileged position as a musician in both fields and also with connections in the capital city, Valparaiso, and other provincial cities of the country, he was able to see these frictions and address them publicly. The Musicians Mutual Aid Society of Valparaiso had a large tradition of exchanges and fluent communication with other organizations, both manual workers and musicians' organizations from the same city and across the country. They especially communicated with other mutual aid societies, um, with other mutual aid societies of different trades, rather than with institutions related with the music industries. In other words, the mutualized musicians were well connected with those not necessarily working in the music industries, but working in different trades and sharing the mutual aid aims and similar working conditions. One event that called my attention here was the reciprocity agreement that this mutual aid society signed with the Sociedad Unión Musical, an association from Santiago founded in 1924. This agreement responded to a petition that the Sociedad Unión Musical did to the Mutual Aid Society of Valparaiso after the decease of one of its members, José Devia, who unfortunately died in Valparaiso. This agreement was the practical solution of the problem that Devia's death involved. As he died in Valparaiso and not in Santiago, his fellow members asked them to bury his corpse in the mausoleum that the Musicians Mutual Aid Society of Valparaiso had. 
to do this, they needed to sign this agreement, which probably was facilitated by Pablo Garrido, the current secretary of, the, of this organization. The musician, some of the musicians who, fought, who signed this agreement were academic musicians. We can see, I don't, I don't know if it, it's visible, but <laughs> uh, we can read the signature of Armando Carvajal, Alfonso Leng, Pedro Humberto Allende, among others. All of these participated in the Sociedad Baj as well. Two main questions arise here. Beyond the practical solution that this agreement offered, were other reasons behind the exchange between these two organizations? If so, what, what would that be? I'd say that nowadays results striking to see the handwriting of these prestigious musicians in the minutes of books of a barely unknown mutual aid society. I think that this agreement was beneficial for both. On the one hand, the mutualized musicians receive the legitimation of their fellow musicians in Santiago, giving them some artistry. On the other, the academic musicians from Santiago sought from this mutual aid society a concrete solution to a very real and mundane problem, where to bury their loved ones. However, in what way this agreement changed our perception of these academic musicians? Why Garrido? was a member of the Mutual Aid Society of Valparaíso and did not join other organizations such as Sociedad Unión Musical or the Sociedad Baj? What were the main differences between these? Let's bear in mind these questions while I try to outline a definition or characteristics of the working lives of these two organizations. By the late 1920s, the Musicians Mutual Aid Society of Valparaiso was transformed into a musicians' union, becoming the first one of its type in 1931. Although Pablo Garrido was away from Valparaiso between 1926 and 1932, he was one of the leaders of this new musicians' union. Because of his interest towards musicians' working lives, he was elected president in 1934, post that he served for, four, for two years. Um, sorry. Yes, in 1939, he moved to Santiago and he served the same post in the Professional Orchestral Union, Sindicato Profesional Orquestal, founded in 1932. In 1940, he organized the first Musician Congress to which Garrido invited musicians from across, across the country in order to create awareness about the need of a national meeting in which they could discuss the main problems of the music profession and propose solutions to the government, um, 16 unions of the country plus other musical institutions so, such as the National Conservatoire Students' Union participated. But where the, what were the main concerns that Garrido sought in the music profession? How did he address these problems? One of the concerns that he had was the unemployment and working conditions of musicians. We already talked about the arrival of the sound cinema technologies and the unemployment uh, that that created for musicians. Um, Pablo Garrido was also affected by this by this problem. He was also he lost his job as a theatrical musician, and he started to to play in in a com in a variety company. And then uh, by 1930. Well, he was in Antofagasta, he created and uh, conducted the, the Symphonic Orchestra of Antofagasta, including with 30 musicians, both amateur and professionals. Um, it's relevant to read what he wrote here uh, by, this, by these years regarding the, this new Symphonic Orchestra. Um, well, he said that the musician seems to be relegated to a second place. And for many people, the musician is not more important than a ballet de chambre or something like that. Unfortunately, there is a systematic prejudice. Why? It is an enigmatic situation. Let it be clearly understood that the musician works just like a doctor, a lawyer, or a clerk. He, and his labors are artistic and intellectual. Um, and then he said, he recalls, 
Let us remember, remember that Beethoven was always badly dressed, wearing unpolished boots, tangled hair, and grumpy to all sociability. Mozart had splendor but brief days, and misery was his partner for many years until he died. He claimed that the musicians have been historically denied and relegated to a second place in society because their contribution and labor was, has not been properly valued. He strongly argued that musicians are workers, but their work should be valued um, and their work should be valued as the work of any other professional. However, he also state that the musical work is different to the work of a law doctor or a lawyer because his labors are artistic and intellectual. Um, yeah, and then in 1935 he wrote a retrospective reflection of what have changed after the arrival of the sound cinema technology and he highlighted this idea of um, the, the last part of the paragraph uh, when he said that was the only way to do something positive towards our profession. Isolated efforts get us nowhere. It is the joint action which leads us to beautiful ends. He, when he talked about joint action, he referred to the activities that he carried out specifically with his jazz orchestra in terms of the system of self-criticism that they established in order to learn and to improve musically, but also uh, the, it's important to know that this co joint action that he uh, tried to state it in the musical work itself, he also stated and addressed it in the, mus in the social organization of musicians. Uh, another topic that he wanted to, that he criticized it, or he was concerned about, was the promotion of national music. Um, he, yeah, he also he criticizes the radio broadcasters, especially because they weren't they weren't uh, they they didn't uh, broadcast Chilean music but uh, foreign music mainly. But also he criticizes his fellow composers for com being for composing following Western traditions and not our national traditions, whatever that means. We can discuss that later. <laughs> um, yeah, and in 1928, the first rules of the Nas Musicians' Union of Valparaiso were written by the mutualized musicians. <coughs> As you can see, that this is the draft of the, the first rules. Uh, it was called a professional union which meant that a professional union of teachers of the, of the province of Valparaiso, which meant that on the one hand, this union was created for musicians based in all the province, not just in the city, including all the musicians that were working, in, especially in Viña del Mar, in the new uh, casino and orchestra that were, very, uh, were, were growing with very, very much intensity at those years, um, but also, that the word professional it doesn't mean uh, has no relation with the quality of the musicians, and not and doesn't mean anything about the the training of them, if for academic or not. It just was the um, was just following the 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 the, um, the rule of unionization, the law of unionization that explicited that unions must be. Uh, formed under or by work by trade, industrial unions or professional unions. Um, yeah. Also, it is important to highlight that the, for the first time in history of the musicians' organization, uh, it was included the word "work" in the main aim of the organization. That wasn't. Uh, present in nor in the mutual aid society nor in the so in the Bach society, m just in the mu musicians union. So this leads us to the issue of the music profession. Um, so to understand what the union understood as the music profession, we need to analyze who joined the union, how they protect their profession, and how it was composed 
the membership of the union. Um, yeah, it, uh, the statutes didn't uh, didn't they didn't were explicit of the music they should play or training or it says that it can be uh, they allowed anyone who is in the music trade or anyone who dedicate itself to the music trade uh, being for example conductors, directors, employers, contractors, and anyone who, those who provided their services individually. This is quite interesting because the musicians understood one of the particularities of the music profession in terms that allowed musicians to join with different and various employment conditions. Employers or employees, directors or contractors, musicians who work individually or collectively. Um, yes. Yes, and just to finish, uh, it is important also to understand who were allowed to, to join informally by the internal rules of the organization, but also who were who actually joined and who actually didn't join. So I think that this to understand this membership allow us to think who were the musicians that were included in this kind of organization and who were excluded. After the review of the membership, we can say that the working lives of musicians, uh, were correct of the musicians who were part of this organization, were those mainly players, performers, with the ability or the training to play different genres to learn music very quickly and to adapt very quickly to any requirement, especially in live music, ni in live music night venues or on and radio auditorium musicians. The union gathered mainly backup musicians or session performers, but also conductors, composers, and arrangers of popular music such as Pablo Garrido. Um, I think that these characteristics outline, um, outline the definition of the music profession that left both singers, not instrumentists, and composers of classical or academic music outside the musicians' union. Although the internal rules were stated that everyone who worked in the music trade could join. However, in practical terms, it was not open to all, or not all musicians wanted to join this organization. So before I finish, I'd like to recall that this analysis of membership is just an example of how musicians' organizations are defined, both formally and informally. This definition is directly connected with the definition that the musician made of itself as a performer, a composer, or both. As, and it is also connected with how the musician defines who is a musician or who is a performer, or who is a composer, and who is not. Why some organizations allow to join certain types of musicians and, exclu and exclude others? This is also a way to protect and to control what they define as their music profession. To finish, I'd like to invite you to think critically what kind of music profession is promoted by the organizations in which you participate, including this one. How do you define yourself as musicians and how your idea of music profession can collaborate with the ideal of the music profession that other musicians have? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Alin, for this uh, great presentation. Uh, I will open the round of questions immediately. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, I had the impression that you use the term work and profession, or worker and professionalist, um, as a synonymous. No. No. Okay. Yeah. Because um, I, I, I was thinking, um, with reference to the Austrian musicians, we are talking here. Uh, for uh, portfolio careers uh, in the sense that most of them, they, uh, 
they survive as professional uh, uh, um, uh, musicians because they combine different activities. Mm. A lot of them are involved in music teaching. Mm. So th this is one issue. And, um, and there is also a distinction between um, work in the sense that there is a very low level of, of uh, independence and profession in the sense that there is not just a formal uh, 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 education, but also a higher level of uh, uh, independence. And, and I think um, we could uh, uh, look at the uh, music field in a more, um, in, uh, as a variety of different practices mm. and different conditions. So it, it, it will be a little bit difficult to have one term for mm. all musicians mm -hmm. who are working in completely different uh, surroundings. Mm -hmm. um, yes, I think that also depends on the context and on the historical times. This is a more uh, historical yeah. research, uh, but it also obviously it considers that that differences. And yes, the work, when I said work in music, uh, working or the work, the musical work, I refer to the work itself of the way of approaching the, the creation or the performance or whatever the music, the musician is doing in exchange of a, red, of a payment or with wha what we understand by, by a, a job in any discipline. And by profession, I, I, am, I am trying to define it. I think that that's what musicians, in their differences, define differently. For example, composers in the academy, they protect their profession, for example, allowing or not allowing people with no formal instruction or with exams uh, for un before allowing them to join their organizations, or for example, uh, providing some previous experience, uh, musical music creation, for example, that that sort of things. Uh, but it's obviously sti that is what is defined by the type of musician that I'm. I think. I was thinking, is, is there like a practical definition at the time between uh, having like a union? Um, because you spoke about the difference between unions and mutual aid societies mm -hmm. and so on. But between unions and this cr the creation of these associations, like mm -hmm. association of composers, associations of orchestral musicians, like was there like a technical debate at the time of saying this is an association, not a union? Um, there was, uh, in uh, I think that it was practical in the terms for the mutualized musicians in comparison with the unionized, because the law changed, so they now were compelled to unionize under the state, like from above, from up to down, not the opposite. And in comparison with the other societies, uh, I, I think that more than the practical division definition of this is a union or this is a professional association, it was the difference bit of the way that they define their musical work. Like as we were talking before, like this is kind of my hobby because I am also a lawyer and I make my living from this other profession and I do this in my spare time when I feel creative or I am a musician and I make my living from exclusively from this, so I need to... But it was also a uh, difference of social class as well, not just of, uh, of social class and the way that they understood the, their musical work. Because also in the musicians' union there were members that were members of other unions. So that means that they were also workers on other trades like not musical tracks. So I think it's really complex. And what it, I think what is necessary to highlight is that in this, this time, and by the late 20s, I think that, I don't know if it was the only one, but one of, <laughs> of the musicians who, 
who talk about this very with the words, like the word work was Garrido, being a musician of with an academic f uh, training. So I think that's interesting. Good there. Pass the. Thank you. If I'm not wrong, I was surprised to hear that the copyright law was introduced in the 1920s, mm -hmm. because uh, uh, the copyright in industry and the copyright was so important for the publishing sector, even in the 19th century. And uh, uh, what are the reasons why it was uh, introduced so late mm. in Chile? I think it's not the law, but the decree that uh -huh. that it's like the more specific. Uh, like the sub law <laughs> inside the law, uh, I think there it was an, an uh, intellectual copyright or intellectual property, property rights, but it wasn't the same as this one. This changed in the 1920s uh -huh. oh, okay. because they included a new decree that were was more specific for artists yeah. and, and and putting explicitly for theatrical works literature works, music works. The other one was more broad and understanding it as intellectual works. Mm. Somebody else? I wanted to ask you uh, if you know or can tell us a little bit about what are the main differences between this kind of organizations in Valparaíso and Santiago or difference between those in big cities like Valparaiso and Santiago and the rest of the country, or mm -hmm. Santiago and the rest? Uh, the Musicians' Union or in general? The in general. I oh mean, okay. uh, mm -hmm. when they come to exist, it was because in Chile, you know, and mm -hmm. most of you know, that we have a huge problem from centralized yes. Uh, yes. everything. Yeah? Yes. So I think it's uh, in this... Uh, um, in kind uh, the, the, the organizations were formed by city more than national. So that's quite interesting, especially in a centralized country. There was never a national union or a national society in these terms. Um, for example, the in every these societies were also obviously formed in cities where there was an important musical life, industrialized cities. So it has to do also with the venues or theaters that had, that were, uh, that existed in different cities. For example, there were musical societies in Ovalle, in Iquique, Antofagasta, Concepción, Santiago, eh, Valparaíso, eh, San Felipe. Eh, and also they, I think it's a kind of, eh, trend that they follow in terms of different aims of the organizations. Uh, so you can find mutual aid societies in par, par, uh, contemporary in different cities of the across the country, and then later on you can find Musicians Union uh, contemporary uh, in the most industrialized cities, so in Valparaíso, Concepción, Santiago mainly uh, at that time. And I think that I that also happened with the societies or these professional associations that were more connected with universities and uh, conservatoires or music institutes. So yes, those were, I think, more created in Santiago, but I don't know if they were created in a national sense, I even if they, they call they themselves they the National Society, like yes, day. but they gather mainly musicians from Santiago and from the yes. academy or from the conservatoire. So that's a big difference between between the both kind of organizations, I think. And these different uh, small associations that were in uh, Ovalle, and you, called, uh, you named a lot mm -hmm. of cities, uh, did they work together somehow? Or uh, not at all? They were based in their cities. And, but they communicated and they connected for certain activities or events, but they, there was not a national 
organization. The, the, each one worked in, because I think that at the time uh, it was, uh, they were regarding their musical provision of the city. So they, in a way they control the musical provision of the city in musical live venues, for example. But, uh, so when another one from another city have to come to the other one, they have to connect and establish agreements. So they were very well connected, but not necessarily uh, united, you know, like a national confederation of, <laughs> no. Yeah, yeah, just to say something about it. Uh, <coughs> these local societies received money from the local taxes from the cinemas. There was a law on that time, so I think it at mm. the end of the 50s, created by some Yeah, uh, but that Congress. was bec because yeah. they, they claimed for, exactly, for exactly. that. Exactly, exactly. But the thing is, they received this money to develop the local musical life. Mm. Even they gave scholarships to study somebody abroad, and they created big choirs, or some orchestras even in Concepcion, for example. But it was just for the development of the, the local musical life. Mm -hmm. It was, uh, yes, it was the, like a, this kind of intention of trying to compensate the damage that one new technology have, have done to the music scene. Uh, but that was a huge debate and it also, that is a very good example because that for achieving that, they needed to, uni to, to unionize. In that way, not just the musicians, but also with the theatrical workers, with the actors and technicians and all the people who worked in the theaters before the arrival of the South Cinema Technologies. They, together, they, the theatrical society with the musicians, organizations, together they, they gained these, these laws, so yeah. Another question, maybe? The last chance, and then we're going to move to the movie. Okay, so thanks again, okay. Eileen. Thank you.